All righty. Well, uh, welcome. I'm going to I'm going to continue to watch the room and make sure folks uh, are able to enter in. So, just to kick things off, uh, welcome to today's special online discussion hosted by AGL. Uh, we are a nonprofit trade association that supports digital service professionals working to help modernize government. I'm Bill Maley, the Director of Government Relations for AGL. And today we uh, have a, an exciting discussion uh, on the launch of a new project in May by Georgetown University's Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation. Uh, the State Software Collaborative was co-founded by Robin Carnahan and Waldo Jaquith, uh, both formerly of 18F, now uh, formerly serving in the federal government. And so uh, I wanna thank you both for being here. Great to have you. Thanks for having us. So uh, as we have more people piling in, I'm just going to kind of uh, make sure that um, everyone's uh, able to hear us. Um, and, you know, folks, we're going we're gonna to do Q&A at some point, but I'd like to just get the conversation started. Uh, why don't we start, uh, you know, just a, a little bit more with the background. I know you both were formerly of 18F working in the federal government, as I mentioned, but, uh, you know, setting the stage for your work at the Beck Center, uh, wanted to uh, just talk more about your path. How did you get to 18F? Uh, maybe, Robin, we can start with you. Yeah, thanks very much, and thanks for having us, Bill. Um, so, uh, true confession, I'm not a technologist, uh, so I came upon this work in a very different way than, than Waldo and probably many of the folks on the call um, I used to be an elected official in my home state of Missouri and served as Secretary of State for eight years, and I'm a lawyer by training. And So I got into the office, and I'll never forget the first day I showed up. There were more people, uh, like, opening envelopes to prepare checks to be deposited to renew their corporate licenses than we had in our IT department. Um, and this was in 2005, in the beginning of 2005. And it was pretty clear to me, even in 2005, uh, that we needed to do a lot more and a lot better. And so my eight years as Secretary of State, we did a lot of terrific things uh, on technology and moved things online and our customers and the public really loved it. Uh, but it was always the thing that I lost more sleep over than anything I did the whole time I was in office because it was always over budget or overtime or just didn't work. And I was sitting in Jefferson City, Missouri without a ton of tech talent on my team, really relying on vendors, and the incentives were not always lined up, and the contracts didn't always make sense. And so I had a lot of PTSD, frankly, when I left office about technology, um, and turned out to talk to a lot of other elected officials and folks in government leadership positions who felt the same. Um, so this was an opportunity to go to 18F uh, soon after it started to stand up the state and local practice there, which basically is all of the federal funding that goes to state and local governments to do technology. So that's where uh, Waldo and I first got to work together. Great. Well, thank you, Robin. Waldo, how about you? Yeah, I, I just like 10 minutes before we started here, I just found the, these floppy disks. I haven't seen them in years. Floppy disks. One says basic programming and the other says C. So that'll tell you my background as like, a, and I think this, this Babbage's 3.5 inch floppy disk is from maybe like 1987. So unlike your standard issue middle class white kid whose parents bought a computer, uh, I was like on that on that path of like young computer geek, uh, and I, I did a bunch in um, like the open data space uh, just as like a hobby beginning around 2005 maybe we didn't really have the phrase open data then. Uh, but I didn't realize that like there was like this national movement that I was part of. I had no idea of people focusing on on uh, on open open data. I was doing a bunch with uh, legal data and legislative data here in Virginia, uh, where I, I live near Charlottesville, and uh, uh, I was sort of plucked out of obscurity uh, by uh, Secretary of Technology Anish Chopra, who became the U.S. Chief Technology Officer to come work on open data stuff with the White House. So from there, I spent some time in the. Um, I'd, I'd worked for the state of Virginia before that, but I spent some time with the. Um, private sector with a nonprofit called US Open Data. I just finished uh, just about all four years of a four-year term at 18F, uh, where I, I made uh, the inevitable foray of anybody who's really into tech and government. At some point, you get fired up about procurement. And so that's what I did. Robin and I got all fired up about procurement. I still am. I think it's incredibly important. Uh, and uh, that really re revealed to me that like the tech is easy and everything else is hard. Uh, not like not like 
people like me who knew basic and C, like there's millions of us. That's not, that's not all that extraordinary. Um, it's the folks who understand how to actually make government work that's wicked important. Um, and so I spend my time studying from them. Excellent. Thank you. I will Thank say that, that having having gone down the rabbit hole of procurement like uh, Waldo and thinking that was the root of all the problem, at 18F we dug even deeper and decided that budgeting is where it all starts. And so we can talk about this a little bit later, but we came up with a basically a handbook and guide for state legislators and budget committees at the state level because if you budget for a big giant waterfall project then chances are you're going to procure a big giant waterfall contract and it's going to go the way of most big giant waterfall contracts which is uh, not succeed so uh, we're trying to get back to the beginning on budgeting as well great well actually i was going to ask if we could talk just a little bit more about 18f before we move to the uh, collaborative uh, just for anyone that doesn't know, you know, what that is, maybe we could just level set. It's still, it's still going in government, correct? Oh, yeah. And, and, and uh, just a, a quick primer, what, what is it? What sure. is it a, uh, a program? <laughs> yeah, Robin, you, you take this one. You talk all about right. 18F all the time. Yeah, so 18F, uh, so the, the name is not ATF, it's 18F, which is always the first confusion. And it was named after the street address of the building in Washington of the General Services Administration. So around the time, if you take yourselves back to sort of the early 2012-13 era, um, when the President Obama rolled out his uh, signature policy in office, uh, the a ACA, and the website didn't work, if you remember all of that time. And it sort of shined a light on the thing that so many of us know, which is, like, it doesn't even matter what the policy is. If the damn website doesn't work in the minds of the public, it's a failure. So that you have this technology that is blocking progressive or any change or sustainable policy, frankly. Um, so around that same time, uh, there were a couple of initiatives that were going on. One was bringing people into the government to help stand up that website. And that ultimately turned into US Digital Services. And around the time uh, that was happening, they had another team that was embedded at GSA, the General Services Administration, which is, for folks who don't know, it's the buyer of stuff for the government. So it's like from aircraft carriers and pencils and desks to also technology. So 18F was a team that was embedded of technologists inside the federal government to help uh, federal agencies in the beginning buy and build software in smarter ways. And our team started uh, to help state and local governments do the same thing. Thank you. So, well, again, before we get into the collaborative, I was uh, I was wondering if we could talk about uh, what sets the stage. Uh, you just mentioned the uh, the website. I think you were talking about healthcare.gov, the sort of uh, infamous uh, crash of that. And without you know repeating history too much, because I'm sure a lot of folks know what happened there. What, what are some of the conditions that um, led to the creation of a, a, a technology or reform oriented program in federal government? I mean, besides that, what, what were some of the uh, indicators or um, uh, warning signs? I mean, a, a big one is that the success rate of these big high dollar projects in government uh, for big software projects is 13%. You got you got a thirteen percent chance of getting what you're trying to buy within cost schedule performance, and that's even setting aside whether it meets user needs. Like you can meet the contractual requirements without actually doing what anybody needs, and that had just been getting worse and worse for years. Something had to give. Now a lot of things had given, but nothing with a high enough level of attention. So I think we're in retrospect we were lucky that the healthcare.gov debacle was as high profile as it was because it created public demand all at one time from a whole bunch of people and a whole lot of political demand from the president on down to see something done about that. Um, it's not that the failure of healthcare.gov was extraordinary, it's that it's absolutely ordinary. Uh, and so it, it was uh, good and necessary that 18F came about. Um, I wish it had happened earlier, but I'm glad it did. So is it, I mean, is it waterfall? Is it, is it just an old uh, process? I mean, is there anything more that you can talk about in terms of just the, the, the history of it? Sure. So the, the, the history of how these things fail is because government continues to build software like it's 1990. 
uh, the, I mean, obviously there are exceptions. He, here we are, <laughs> like we're really good, pre preaching the choir here, but uh, continues to believe that you can define all your requirements up front, uh, continues to believe that you can pay one vendor and maybe they'll outsource to a bunch of others, who cares? And that as long as you write a tight enough contract, you're gonna get what you need. And really what happens is it'll fail, but you can point a finger at somebody clearly, which doesn't really help much. Um, so 18F had started with the idea that there's gotta be a better way to do that. And one of the initial uh, approaches 18F before my, my time there was thinking 18F can build better technology. And that's true, but that doesn't scale. So a shift that we've seen over the seven years, I guess it's been since 18F started um, is to, instead of building their six, six years, anyway, however many years it's been, instead of building these things, um, teaching other government agencies how to procure these things more effectively. That scales so much better. It's, you know, the teach somebody to fish instead of give them a, a fish model um, of, and that means teaching them how to use user-centered design, uh, product thinking, design thinking overall, agile software development. Scrum is a pretty solid methodology that just about everybody seems to use. Producing open source, using open source. Uh, cloud is a really powerful way to be able to get vendors up and running earlier instead of getting set up within some, you know, on-site environment by an agency. But it took 18 half a while to bring all these threads together and, and create like a, a, a consistent strategy to apply. And I think the, the folks before Robin and I even showed up that had done so much work at 18 f on um, tying these things together for pro procurement, I think that's really what did a lot to, to crack that nut. Okay. Well, so uh, the, the collaborative started in May, launched in May from Georgetown University. I was wondering if you could uh, give us a little more. It, it sounds like it's open source and it's, uh, it's for uh, states to uh, you know, focus on high demand systems that are common you know, throughout. Uh, I was wondering if you could just expand on what's your mission and, and share uh, progress. Well, I'll take the first stab at that and, and Waldo can build on it. Um, you, so the, the idea here came about because it's pretty clear that there are 56 entities that act like states in terms of sort of jurisdictional uh, authority. There are 3,400 counties and 19,000 cities and the interaction that they have, each of those types of government with the, the citizens or public is quite similar. It's like states do the same thing, counties do the same thing, cities do the same thing. And the notion that everybody has to reinvent the wheel and pay for that over and over again um, and have the risk uh, and the not great service in the meantime, just, just didn't make any sense to, to me as somebody who had reinvented my own wheels uh, in the Secretary of State's office. So what we've been thinking about is just, to, and we know states and jurisdictions are unique, but the idea is that they're more similar than not. And that there's probably in many cases, we think about it as like an 80% common sort of core of a solution um, that might need to be 10 or 20% modified and customized, but that mainly the core is going to be the same. Um, and that if we could demonstrate that there was a new way of doing this, that you could collaboratively build a thing that was uh, good for the collective uh, of these states or cities, um, that, that folks would be interested in that. So the key is, as, as you see behind me, demos, not memos. We're not into having conversations about this as much as we are as proving it out. Uh, with pilot states on pilot projects. So that's what we're excited about and that's where we're focused. Robin, could you talk a little bit about what we've been able to, not that we plan to hit the ground running with US digital response stuff? Yeah, you know, interestingly, we, we say all the time that uh, one of the reasons, because you think about why don't states collaborate more, right? They, they, should, know, they should know these things. Well, I, I often say that states will experience the same problem in the sort of timeline of a project, but they're not always at the same point in time with that problem. So some people may be past this problem and onto another problem, which makes them feel much more unique so that they don't feel like collaborating with other people. And so the key was always, we thought to figure out something that was either relatively greenfield, right? So that you didn't have all the past problems to have to deal with or something where they're pro they were all kind of at the same pl starting place. Uh, what, we have, what we've seen since COVID uh, in the last hundred days is something that uh, like we all kind of knew, but is now obvious to everyone, which is a lot of cities and states are having the same problems at the same time. And whether that's 
unemployment websites that can't keep up or whether it's uh, turning to remote workflows and practices instead of having you know people who are applying for public benefits to show up with pieces of paper in person and those be reviewed in person on pieces of paper like all of these things are the same um, and so that has been the interesting thing we've observed and since covid uh, there was a team of folks that raised their hands to volunteer and said you know we're all sitting at home like everybody else and what we know is technology and what it looks like is a lot of cities and states need help with that and it started with a couple hundred people and then uh, grew to be, I think about 5,000 volunteers by now. Um, and so we've been working across the country with city, states and counties with great technologists. It's a very deep bench uh, doing pro bono work. And it's uh, it's been really satisfying to be able to, you know, in a time of pandemic where we're all eager to do something useful uh, to be able to actually be useful. Oh, that's we came into this thinking that we'd have a, a tough time finding states with the same problem at the same time and then convincing them to play ball. And <laughs> that is not, as it turns out, the situation we've actually gotten into. We thought it would take months of like relatively careful choreography, getting the right states at the right place and getting, you know, the right pressure points. And like, no, <laughs> thanks to the work being that we've been able to, to, to do with U.S. Digital Response, states just say, please please help use software that other states made sure great whatever gets this done faster yeah. so i mean everything is going at 10 times the speed that we thought it would our our, our plans were good but are no longer applicable gotcha very interesting so in terms of uh you know some of the some of the systems some of the main high demand systems that we're talking about like i i worked in california on the child welfare digital services project Every state has a child welfare system. Uh, I assume there are similar pro profiles of s such projects in play. I mean, what are you looking at uh, first? I mean, besides what you were just talking about with the, the COVID response, and, and, and perhaps there's a, there's a transition there. You know, what you've done just, uh, just immediately uh, translates to some, uh, you know, uh, low hanging fruit, if you will. Yeah, look, there, there are a number of uh, possible, uh, you know, cases to start, um, and we're exploring those now with, with potential partners. Um, you know, paid family medical leave is one that has been of interest, uh, both because it's Greenfield and because there are several states, you know, in, in the same place. Um, since COVID, obviously, uh, these, these unemployment uh, systems and other public benefit systems that are really seeing just a lot of stress, um, and, and, you know, for... For the first time you have, well, maybe not the first time, but first time in recent history, you have, you know, the politicians having to stand up in front of the news cameras and explain why the damn websites don't work and why people aren't getting paid. And there was record speed in passing a $2 trillion bailout package, a stimulus package. Um, and what was the blocker to getting that into the hands of people that needed it? The websites, the technology, it didn't work. Um, and so I think it shined a light in the same way Obama, the Obamacare rollout and that failure shined a light on sort of the federal uh, uh, need to be able to do this better. I think that this has really shined a light uh, on, on states. Um, and it's not just unemployment systems, it's all public benefit systems. We're doing a bunch with uh, um, uh, pandemic EBT, for example, where, you know, it was hard for people who have SNAP benefits to be able to get um, the, the, the benefits they need and to be able to bank purchase online rather than in person in the middle of a, of a pandemic. So there are lots of things that can be improved. And so uh, we're, looking for, we're looking for states. So if you have any that, uh, that are interested, folks, send them our way. Uh, we've, by the way, are funded through um, philanthropic money. Uh, all, all of a sudden, uh, interestingly, a lot of philanthropies uh, have also seen what the rest of us have seen, which is if we're going to have a if we're going to be able to respond to the next crisis, we have to have a resilient digital infrastructure um, with these entities that are tasked with implementing um, whatever the policy uh, guidance is. And right now, that's not in existence. Yeah, we're we're lucky that the Rockefeller Foundation, before COVID, looked at what we were doing and said, "We like this. We we want to, we want to fund what you're doing here." Um, as with the Beck Center at Georgetown as well, um, but. The, the funding landscape feels real 
real different <laughs> now than it did just back in January. Sure. No, I can, I can imagine. Well, um, so in, in terms of, uh, you know, work, working with the, the federal government, for example, where you just came from, uh, you know, are you, I assume you have, you're having conversations there, you're collaborating with uh, the funding agencies. How, how do they come into play here? I mean, how, how much um, oversight do they have in states where they can really make a difference? And are there, you know, are there, are there areas where uh, you see this is, you know, it's, it's going to lead, you know, efforts uh, with regard to sharing across state lines? Uh, as, I'm sorry, as, as in the, uh, the, the federal funders who? Yeah, the fed, federal yeah. fund, yeah, sorry. So f federal funders, I mean, for some of these programs, provide huge amounts of money. The, the top is the unemployment insurance, which uh, these, these systems are 100% funded by the Department of Labor, which is a, a moral hazard. Like, <laughs> that's trouble with states kicking in nothing. And then you get to, like, um, uh, medication man management information systems. That's like a 90-10 federal investment, which is a really big investment. And then it can slide down quite a bit from there. There's a bunch that are 50-50. I think the... Um, the child welfare systems, the, what the SACWIS, CWIS upgrades, I think that's like a 50-50 federal mm -hmm. match. Um, so different agencies have different levels of um, to sensitivity, you could say, at both the state and federal level as to how well these problems go and how they should fund them. Um, I think it might have bubbled up with states, but I wouldn't swear to that. But being around 20, 2008 anyway, we saw states on these unemployment insurance websites starting to say, why, why are we doing this every state one at a time? Why don't we team up? Uh, and labor was willing to start funding this, these like group projects um, and say, okay, you get a few states coming to us, we'll, we'll fund you working on this together. Um, unfortunately, all those seem to be in like different levels of going badly. And as best I can tell, it's mostly because they didn't do anything else differently. There's no agile, there's no user center design uh, there's, you know, there's no iterative delivery, uh, there's no change in the procurement process, and so on and so forth. Um, they've just taken waterfall software development and spread it between states, which, I mean, even on an agile basis, just consider this, ba this basic question that I suspect everybody on this call can relate to. Let's say you get four states collaborating. Who's the product owner? Like, somebody's going to be the product owner, and are they work for one state, or do they have to set up a new organization and they somehow represent the interests of all those states? And how do you do that as a product owner? I'm not, so, my, I'm not saying that any of this is easy, but just that if that sounds hard within Agile, imagine within Waterfall, <laughs> you're, you're really sunk there. So I think some federal funders uh, may, we haven't heard this yet, but may feel like, oh, we tried that and it didn't work. We tried that you know, collaborative thing. Um, but there are lots and lots of cases of government already effectively sharing software collaboratively, the development process, and then also using it once it's already developed. But there are fewer ex examples of a federal agency providing that, that funding to multiple states mm -hmm. and then those states collaborating successfully. There's a bunch of interest in them trying it, particularly around UI. Um, but we'd sure like to see that change. It is rational right now for places like Department of Labor to say, I don't know, we want to fund those. They haven't been going well. It's up to us, and us includes folks on this call, to help prove that, like, no, this does work, and you can get more done for less money. But there's, there's something between, yeah, we tried to build the exact same thing for everybody in Waterfall, and it failed, and everybody building their own thing. And that's probably a shared base of, like, we figure it's like 80% that they have in common, and then it's customized on top of that. But that requires a you know particular software architecture to work. You can't just give somebody finished software, whether it even means, and say good luck customizing it. Um, they have to be a lot of you have to be really deliberate in how you build software in order to make that happen. Um, and then once that's something that fund funders can plug into, then I think we're going to see federal funders say, "I like this." And our, our dream state is when we talk about those funding ratios would be a federal funder saying, "Okay." You, you need funding for your unemployment insurance system. That's great. We'll give you 20% of funding. You match 80. Unless you use a shared solution, then we'll provide 90% of the funding and you provide 10%. We can create these incentives uh, that I think will, will help make a difference. But there's some changes we need to bring about in the world before it makes sense for agencies to try to provide those funding incentives. Sure. So we'll the, other, the other thing, let uh, me just uh, jump in here, Phil, is, is, is sustainability, right? 
because it's one thing to, to, to build a thing and it's another to, to sustain it. And one of the things that we've seen in government in particular is they tend to think of these big uh, software projects as, as infrastructure in the same way that they would think of building a bridge. And so they fund it like it's a bridge. It's one big chunk of money. And then there's an O&M contract to like patch up the bridge uh, for the next 30 years. But that that's been the sort of mental model of how to do software. Um, and everybody on this call knows that that's not how modern software is, is done, that it's more like a puppy that is cheaper to get into at the beginning, but you have to like care and feed and take care of and nurture or you don't want to be near it. Um, and so one of the key things is to, is to like help decision makers and, and budget, uh, budget committees that are funding these things understand that if they would fund these in smaller incremental chunks that are steady and predictable, and instead of having an O&M contract that you're always developing and improving and iterating on these products, that it's cheaper to get into at the start, but you need a steady flow, that it's like an operating expense. Uh, that's a big part of what we talk about, uh, but also want to create, which is a governance model uh, to sustain these things. Well, what is your answer to states who say, um, we're, we're unique. Our system is so special that there's no way that you could possibly fill our requirements. And I- They I, all I, say I, that. <laughs> well, uh, what, what's your answer? I mean, th there must be some, uh, you know, some way to accommodate the most basic jurisdictions, uh, you know, starting from the most basic and then, you know, onto the more complex environments. So here's the thing, they're already sharing their software with other states. It's just being piped through a vendor who they're paying $50 million for that privilege. Some big company is hired by one state to build what's custom software then, and then they declare it to be COTS that they can resell to other states. And you might need some customization fees, and those are 5, 10, you know, 20, 50. Long, longer, longer they stick around, the higher those fees get to customize the software. But at no time was that commercial off the shelf software. That was a fiction. So states are already sharing software with each other. One of our clients today at 18F uh, got this software that was ostensibly off the shelf. And it was just unceremoniously dumped on them at the end and like, good luck. This is for their um, eligibility enrollment system for, for Medicaid. Unlike and, a CD-ROM, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, That's like terrible. on a CD, yeah. he, here's your software. It's all done, uh, customized for you. And so we showed up maybe six months after that had happened and they were just saying like, help, <laughs> what do we do? Great clients, really, really love working with Alaska on this. But one of the things we did was like review the code, the Java and the Java over and over again, like the class names and, and some of the, the method names and so on was the name of the state that this had been built for in the first place. And it wasn't Alaska, <laughs> it was a different state entirely. So they're, sh they're already sharing software. They're just paying a huge amount of money for the privilege of doing so. The other, the other thing I would say is, you know, things have changed a lot over the last couple of decades, as we all know, and there's just a lot more um, very discreet actual COTS or SaaS products that you don't have to change a lot. Um, we had, a, and, and that you can, you can just use and plug into things. We had an interesting example of, of this situation recently in a, in a state with the U.S. Digital Response Team where they had a lot of backlog on their SNAP benefit eligibility determination. So the state had an online application somebody could uh, make to get their SNAP benefits, uh, but the determinations took humans being there looking at physical pieces of paper. So they wanted to figure out how to move that process online to be more user-friendly for the applicant, but also to make it possible to do the determinations on the part of the state staff. And, and this is a crazy story, but we had three pro bono volunteers from the USDR team that talked with the state, talked about what products and licenses they already had. And in three days, were able to stand up something that allowed the applicants to take pictures with their cell phones, send that into a secure HIPAA compliant, you know, uh, uh, county-based, you know, system of file sharing for five hundred dollars a month, because they were using license, they were using things that they already had licensed, and they just put those things together. 
And the state w was surprised and said, you mean 500,000 a month? And they are like, no, $500 a month. These are, these are products in the commercial marketplace that we just need to get uh, states and cities and counties to be able to access. Um, this, is, this is what's so fun to me right now because we have a high demand by the public for remote and digital interaction with government. And we have the cons budget constraints that all of these cities and counties and states are gonna be facing with the, with the decline in tax revenues. It feels like the right time to be able to introduce this kind of sharing of software. I, I wanna add uh, just in response to a point that um, uh, Catherine made in a comment earlier that we're focusing on states just because we had to start with something and because we think that of the levels of government we could work with that states are particularly well positioned. There's not an enormous number of them com compared to say localities or um, uh, interlocality regional organizations or health association. You know, there's all these different levels of, of governance. This is a good way to start. What we're talking about here works from a multinational level all the way down to the most local of governments. Um, sometimes even better in, in some ways at those other levels than here. We were just picking with what we knew and were, were comfortable with. But uh, our selection of working at a state level is in no way a negative endorsement of the value elsewhere. We just had to, had to scope down what we were doing. Okay, good point. Well, folks, uh, ask your questions in the chat. Um, I, uh, I want to make sure that we have time to, to get your questions. So, um, mo moving on to a different topic, um, uh, so licensing. We we've been talking about um, open source, uh, we're talking about sharing technology across state lines or jurisdictions. Um, what sorts of licensing issues do you face? And also, um, is, there, is there a security issue with uh, the, the fact that it's open source and people can, everyone can read the code? Yeah, so I'll take that in the opposite order. Security issue, oh, hell no. Uh, security through obscurity just doesn't work. Um, open source is, uh, is way more secure. The Department of Defense, if you search for uh, Department of Defense open source frequently asked questions, has this great guide saying in no uncertain terms that open source is substantially more secure and should be strongly preferred. And the, uh, the strongest example as to why closed source ain't going to work is Edward Snowden. Like, the theory for closed source is nobody will ever get our source code. Yeah, but what about when they do? <laughs> What's your plan then? So beginning with your code being open means you don't need to worry about that, and it forces you to adhere to modern security practices, which uh, are premised on the idea of transparency and openness. And just going back through the history of cryptography, when cryptography was premised on secrecy, it didn't work. You have to have a secret key and everything else you do cryptographically ought to use open established standards. That's how you create good security. On the licensing, so I'm gonna take a, a strident viewpoint here, which is uh, software that's produced by government should be in the public domain. If, if, if we're paying for it, we, the, the people of the United States are paying for it, we should own and have access to it. Now, as a licensing matter, that gets a little complex for things like how, why would any state want to be a member of an interstate software thing if whether or not you're a member, you get the software. But of course, there's other benefits to being able to have a seat at the table of uh, an organization putting together open source software. Like you get to decide what's done. Your, your users are represented. Your needs are represented. Um, so we think even if that software, and certainly we think the, the prior art shows that even if that software is available in the public domain, there's still a lot of value for states to want to be a member of a co-op like that. And if anything, it increases the demand from other states because uh, they can try it out and say, this is cool. Can we get some tech support? No, not unless you're a member. Well, can we have some input as to how to shape this thing? Not unless you're a member. Um, so, so far that's worked out in the smaller models that we looked at and we sure hope that we can continue to advance that here. Yeah, there was there's one that I was a little bit familiar with from Secretary of State days. It's called the Election Registration Information mm, something cooperative collaborative, the acronym of ERIC because everything has to have an acronym. Um, but it was for election officials who wanted to check voter registration lists across state line. So every state takes care of its own voter registration list uh, and 
lo and behold, it will come as no surprise that when people move from one state to the next, they seldom call their election official to say, I've moved, take me off the voter list, which just doesn't happen. And so these, you get like lots of extra names of people on lists. And so this cross-state matching um, was done with one of these cooperatives several years ago. And it's, and it's been really interesting to see, you know, they started with a handful of states that were sort of the core that really wanted to solve the problem. And I think they're up to 30 or more states by now. Uh, and the, of, of course, the price has gone down for every state that's been added. So um, there is a sustainable model there. So these things exist. It's just a matter of trying to scale them and introduce them to uh, across the board in government. Okay, excellent. All right, well, uh, Catherine has a question. How do you help governments get comfortable with low-cost SaaS products buying software outside of the traditional RFP process? Sometimes literally gov governments don't believe our pricing model is possible. We see a bit of this with U.S. Digital Response with the initial intake call when we have to tell them like, no, seriously, it's free. We have extremely capable volunteers. It's free. And they're, sometimes they're like, yeah, but where's the charge? We're like, there's no charge, but they can't believe it. And even if in fact, what we offered was like low cost, they would still have a hard time believing it because they're used to these like really terrible um, vendor relationships, which, which is frustrating. Um, so one of the things that, that we have talked about with um, getting government comfortable with these low cost SaaS projects is helping them to, or products, is helping them to understand the conditions under which it's okay to use SaaS in the first place. Um, that as long as they can get their data out, both contractually uh, and uh, in a practical sense, then they don't need to worry about getting locked into that. Um, so we talk about that and also about, um, you know, something we've seen a bunch of US digital response, that there's a lot of low cost SaaS options for, for the sorts of infrastructure they need for responding to COVID. Like how do we get a form that people can complete to give us feedback about something? It's Google Forms, you just do it. It'll cost you like 10 bucks a month. You can just do it, it's okay. But the, the way that government is set up normally is entirely around a procurement process. That like, you can't research anything on your own, God knows, as a government employee. You have to write an RFI and see what responses people give you. And you write an RFP based on that and see what bids you get. And like, small vendors don't respond to these RFPs. Life is too short. Like the, the markup, the, the time it takes to respond to these RFPs doesn't possibly make it worth the while of getting that new customer. So we need some real changes in how government thinks about procurement. The procurement laws and regs are fine. It's the approach that's being taken. This like, uh, I can know nothing unless industry delivers to me in response to an RFI. Like that thinking is really problematic. Uh, but every, every client we've worked with, every we work with, there's somebody there in the procurement shop that is like, yes, finally, somebody backing me up on this. Yes, I wanna work like this. Yes, this seems like a better way to go. We just need to empower these people. How do we do that? I don't know. It's a very hard problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, from Jessica. Uh, can you speak a bit more about the pilots you're working on? Are they limited to collaborative projects, procurements, or starting with a state-by-state -state model? You, I, I'll tell you about our, our big, we'd like to be our big project. We got a specific chunk of funding from Rockefeller that we're gonna focus on as like a, a main project here. There are smaller things, but answering those would, wouldn't answer your question well. Um, we're looking for that initial space to work within and we're talking to people in a few different segments of uh, particularly uh, workforce development, paid fill and medical leave, uh, and then some um, uh, Medicaid stuff as well. We're trying to find a right area where we have states with the same problem at the same time who are willing to try something different. And what we want to, to do with them as soon as we identify what that is, is begin with a collaborative procurement. Now, we're gonna handle that procurement because getting states to team up on a procurement, good luck. Like it has to happen, but that's like months, months of work and we wanna work a lot faster than that. So we're gonna, through Georgetown University who employs us, we're gonna run that procurement, but as if it's a government procurement, we're going to publish an RFP in the manner that we prescribe that they use with the template that we prescribe that they use. Uh, we're going to review the vendors the same way that we advise that they do where you get really short proposals back you know, 10, 15 pages, and then do a sort of a down select. So the very best proposals you wind up doing verbal interviews with their proposed key personnel. And then from that, 
select the vendor that seems to be the most capable of doing the work. We want to go through that collaborative process while already working with two, three, probably no more than four states and, and take them through that process so they can all see what a healthy vendor relationship looks like, what it looks like to work with competent developers. Like they've often just never seen this. So to just exhibit that to all of them and then get that iterative delivery so they see how that works and then be able to work with the states on implementing that, that software when it's done after, we'll see, we'll see how much we can get for our money, you know, four or five, six months of, of sprints. Um, we'd like to work like that. We think that's going to work a whole lot better than just working with one state and then working with another one. I think the best way to get states to work together is to actually get states to work together. We'll, we'll see how that goes, but that's our, that's our theory. The work we've been doing for the past, I mean, we just started last month, but the work we've been doing for, for the past month and change is around state by state, as in uh, with US digital response stuff, as in you need the software, well, they need the software too. We're going to build this thing for you. Hey, does it work for you too? Great. Do you want it? Because we've got it. Great. You can have it. Um, it's a very different approach than our like uh, pre-COVID conceptualization. Uh, and I, I still think we're going to be able to execute on that uh, collaboratively procured model. Great question. I thought that might be too esoteric to bring up here, but glad to have a chance to talk about it. Yeah, I'm seeing these questions from uh, Ben uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, yeah. I'll take a couple of those. Uh, how can government encourage or support vendors to provide innovative multi-state solutions? Um, I, I think that there are two two ways. Uh, one is the federal government can incentivize that, uh, particularly when they are the primary investors in these projects. I think of them as the investors who can put uh, put strings on the money that they are investing. And so, if the federal government, as the investor, encourages that and incentivizes it, it will happen. Um, and alternatively, uh, when states see that they have shared shared pains. Um, and, and needs, and they have shared budget constraints. So that there's gonna be an incentive for them to try to solve that in a new way. Uh, the next question about blame and how much does the vendor community uh, deserve the blame when these things go wrong? Um, I think it is a, 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 it's a really interesting question. I think the vendor community generally just responds to what is being asked of them. And so when the government puts out an RFI that says, I want, you know, a new child welfare system. Um, and it's got to be this giant big thing that the switch is going to flip one day, then vendors are going to respond to that, even if they think that that isn't the right approach uh, to doing it. So um, while I think there is some uh, blame on the part of some of the legacy vendors who've been at this a long time, uh, I think an awful lot of it goes to the, to the government for not knowing how to be a good buyer. So that's why we're trying to educate the buyers uh, to, to be able to know what to ask for and not try to outsource all the risk uh, and essentially outsource their mission, which is what all too often happens. They need to take ownership and responsibility of setting priorities and being clear about what the outcomes are that are needed. And if, if, that, was, if that was the case in RFPs, I suspect more people on this call would bid on projects and that they would be more successful. One of the problems with the, the, the system that, that Ben is describing here is that everybody's behaving rationally. Like vendors are definitely behaving rationally. G government is behaving rationally, but I still think we, I have to stop saying we, I'm not a Fed anymore. We, I still think of myself as one. We deserve the, the, the bulk of the blame because we're in the position to fix it. And vendors aren't. It's a, you know, don't play, hate the player, hate the game kind of a scenario here. But clearly the onus is on government to do better and expect better um, and stop these contracts that get bigger and bigger and bigger and more prescriptive, uh, which just results in bigger and bigger and more specific failures uh, instead of creating smaller contracts so you can isolate that risk and make it possible for new vendors to, to get involved. Uh, you, you're not, very few companies are capable of bidding on a hundred million dollar contract. I mean, very few. Lots and lots of them, including folks on this call, are perfectly capable of bidding on a $5 million contract or a $10 million contract. And that's the transition that it's up to, to government to make. Yeah, Edwalda touched on it a little bit earlier. And like to me, the whole key of fixing this ecosystem and marketplace is, is lock-in and lowering switching costs. Um, right now, the, the model is that somebody gets this contract, they've built the bridge, they get it, they own it for 30 years, and then something may or may not happen. But you're never going to get the A-team, and you're never going to get the best price 
if the government has no choice. And so to me, it really is about educating government that they've got to have access to their data. They got to have, and that's both, as Waldo said, a technical issue sometimes, uh, but also a contractual issue. And if they could fix that so that they could move uh, from, from vendor to vendor um, when, when, when things change, because that's the thing we know about technology is it's going to change. So that's a certain, and we know policy is going to change. Um, and so we want to be able to change along with that. So lowering switching costs and anticipating change is really the thing we talk about an awful lot. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, another question from Noah. Uh, as a government, how do you market, do market research to find out if multi-state solutions exist, uh, even if you go out uh, with vendors uh, with, a, with an RFX? I don't know, Noah. Like that's seriously a hard problem. And that's one of the problems that Rob and I have to crack. I mean, I'm, I've been searching around as I find, uh, I'm documenting a bunch of examples, I'll provide a link to it here, of uh, intergovernmental software sharing. Um, and there's, I, I must only have the tip of the iceberg in this Google doc that I've been, that I've been putting together here. Um, you know, there, how, how do you find, <laughs> existing software being shared between states. There's not like a clearinghouse for that. And that's not something that we're going to solve in the next six or 12 or 18 months, but we'd sure like to get state governments on a path to that, um, some place to start looking. Because I, I mean, some of the things in this document, I had no idea existed. I mean, just the very first one I have listed here is uh, Georgia, their state library system. They built their own ILS, their own their own library system, like you know that tracks books that are checked out and inventory and and um, card holders and so on. They built completely open source. It's not just used within Georgia. There's 1,800 libraries that this software is deployed in around the world. How would you? They're not going to respond to an RFP, you know? <laughs> like open source projects don't respond to RFPs. How would you know it existed unless maybe a vendor? saw that and proposed, we'll implement this open source software for you. Uh, but there's a lot less incentive to do that as opposed to the vendors like, you know, Millennium. And so I used to be on my local library board. So this is like information rattling around in my head. Um, you know, these are big vendors that will give you a heck of a proposal and sell you a really expensive ILS. Um, so there's this really great software already existing, but I, the, Noah, the answer is I have no idea how you'd find it. I, I legitimately don't know. And that's a problem that's on us to help solve. All right. Other questions? Uh, can I steal this quote for the future? Okay. Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's public domain, Noah. It's now we can, we can quote Noah Kaplan for having said that. <laughs> So I, will say that, I, I, I did will say once respond to an RFP as promoting an open source project. In 2000, I was 21 years old and my city, Charlottesville, issued an RFP for I forget what. And I, my, I actually like had me and my staff respond to the RFP with like a 10 page proposal maybe, which seemed incredibly long, saying like, just use Apache for your web server. Don't use Microsoft IS. What's wrong with you? Of course, I never heard from them again. That was my one effort to actually have an open source project respond to an RFP. I will say that we, we've also talked about in terms of where to look, Noah, um, that a, you know, a, a, an ideal future state would be a GitHub for government, right? Um, where it was a repository that it housed um, uh, software that was intended from the beginning to be reused, uh, easy to stand up and sustained. So we'd love for y'all in Colorado to be part of that. Okay, uh, any uh, more questions going once? Hey, well, so uh, go ahead. Bill, do you, mind, do you mind if I give a couple other quick examples of I think like really great existing software sharing? No, by, by all means, please do. I, I've been really interested in the different models of like why people share software, like what's the incentive model and how is it funded and how is it supported and where does it live? And a few of my favorite examples that illustrate the spectrum. So at one end in Georgia is WinGap, uh, comma, com computer assisted, um, oh shoot. Anyway, it's the, it's the taxation estimates for like how much property is worth so you can tax it, uh, that estimation process. So like this is a huge source of revenue for Georgia counties. So something like 15 years ago, it's been a while. 
like a bunch of counties came together and pooled their money, got some assistance from the State Department of Taxation, and they set up this nonprofit organization with the board of directors is the members. Um, all but six or 10, I don't know, all but 10 of Georgia counties are in this consortium. The Atlanta area does their own thing. And like, I'm gonna have to tell you, this software is ugly. It will win no awards. Like there's no way they do much human centered design, but by God, it works and they love it. They document their governance structure. They have these meetings a few times a year. It is solving all of their problems that, that they have collectively that is, that is addressed with software. It seems great. I've arranged to have a phone call with the, the uh, current head of the, the organization right now. Um, so that's like one extreme. And then in the middle, there's Open Trip Planner, which was created by Portland's transit agency. And the question is like, how do I get from point A to point B within the city? So that's the software that can, that can say, well, you can you know, rent a bike here to get there and then you can get on the train to go here and then get a bus for like the last five blocks. Um, so Open Trip Planner was created just for Portland, uniting the three authors of three existing passenger facing software programs. It's entirely open source and now it's used entirely around the world with this open governance process. So it's not just in use in the place that it was designed for. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's not maintained or owned by any of those original transit agencies. It's just this more open governments pro uh, process. And on the far extreme, you have QGIS with anybody who's any, done any like mapping stuff has used QGIS, not created by government in any way, but government needs it. Like it's really essential to do all kinds of mapping. So if you look at the change log to QGIS, you see routine commits either made by government or the government seems to be paying like software developers to make to add the feature that they need to QGIS. So we've got these, these extremes all the way across. Um, and it's all collaborative. In all cases, we see multiple folks from government scrubbing in on this, um, but with you know, different, different results and different approaches. And I'm not here to say that one is any, any better or any worse, uh, but it's been fascinating to see the different approaches. Great. Well, actually, that's a good segue to our next question from Mark is, uh, have you looked at efforts outside of the U.S. to get governments to use and share open source? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I see Sean on the call from, from Canada. You know, we, we've got uh, international representation in this space. Um, and a bunch of what I've documented in this document is international examples, because there are some great examples from outside the U.S. The U.S. is getting schooled on how to do this stuff correctly. Uh, I mean, so, some of these intergovernmental uh, organizations set up, like I, I was looking at one where the prime ministers of two countries personally signed these documents to figure out how to work together. Uh, so the commitment level seems to be really high, but yes, looking to other countries seems to be really important. And, and particularly I will say our colleagues and uh, we've worked closely with in Canada and the UK um, you know, by the U.S. Digital Service Team and 18F were inspired by the, the Digital Service Team in the U.K. And many of our former colleagues uh, at 18F are now up in Canada doing things. And so it's, it's been fun to be able to do this stuff cross-border. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, let's, uh, last call for questions. Uh, if you have any uh, additional questions, please post in the chat. I've got a final question uh, regarding outreach. So I, I remember when I was, you know, here in California, when I was working on the project I mentioned earlier, uh, what, I, what I was constantly reminded of is it was hard to get California to think outside of California, uh, even for California's own good. So, you know, what, what would be the benefit? What's your outreach strategy to try to convince states that it's in their greater interest to think beyond their own borders and consider open source? Yeah, um, it turns out, you know, if you're, if you're in a state, your job is really to only take care of the people in your state. If you're elected, that's who elects you. If you're working there, that's who's paying you. Uh, and so there's no natural reason why people would do this because it's not incentivized. So again, part of it is encouraging federal partners who are investing in these projects to, to encourage the sharing and, and collaboration. Uh, but the other is to show that people can get value out of it, right? And that's what we've been seeing through the, the COVID response and the U.S. digital response work that Waldo mentioned, where literally the first question on calls now is always, who else has done this? Like, is there something else we can use? Rather than like, 
who like how do we create this on our own like people get this now and so i think it is a, a bit of a mindset shift um and again so between that seeming like a possibility that it might be relevant plus budget constraints that are going to make sharing even more sensible going forward uh i think we'll get people's attention so who knows this is going to be a long project you've got to as isn't it you agile people say you eat the elephant one bite at a time um that feels like a thing we're going to have to do here as well i i came into this too thinking you know, there's some good examples of software already being shared between government. You know, maybe we just need to make some some new ones and build on those. And then as I got into research a couple months ago about like, I think I started with me asking on Twitter, hey, can people give me good examples of software shared between government? Oh my God, <laughs> there is so much. And I think it turns out an important thing that we can do isn't just creating or fomenting the creation of this, this uh, software share between governments to show the value, but highlight the many existing examples of really valuable work. I mean, when, when somebody says to me, can government create valuable open source, setting aside from sharing, can government create valuable open source? Like I point to SQLite. That was, SQLite was a federal government, a US Navy contract that Richard Hip was working on with, I forget which vendor. And like everything, right? Like your phone surely has several instances of SQLite on it. My printer has SQL, SQLite on it. Like these headphones may well have SQLite on them. Like it's everywhere. So I think there's a bunch of instances of this with uh, software being shared between governments. And I think it's incumbent on us, not just to say, look at our neat idea. No, it's not our idea. All these other people have done it. And I think we need to sing their praises so that governments can say, oh, geez, we, we are already involved with two shared software projects and they're going great. Of course, we should do more of this instead of presenting it as some novel thing. Excellent. All right, well, uh, what a great note to go out on. So I uh, really want to thank you both, Robin and Waldo. Uh, really appreciate your time and our audience members today for, uh, the, uh, for checking in with us and asking good questions. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're recording this, so we're going to post it on our website. Uh, we'll share it with our AGL community, so check our, uh, our website, agilegovleaders.org. And again, thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.